All right, welcome everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. If you can, just post in the chat there. All right, we're gonna get started. So a few days ago, I uh, posted on Twitter that I wanted to see what people wanted to hear more of from me. Oh, good, you can hear me, great. Um, so I thought I'd come do a quick AMA, try to interact more with the community here and answer any questions you guys have. We saw some really good questions come in, so I'm gonna go through them in about 15 minutes. And I can't talk about any assets we may or may not add or speculate about that um, just because of our trading policy, but I'll try to answer anything else that's on your mind. And um, if you haven't already, just subscribe to our YouTube page. We're gonna try to post more of these and some good content. So let's uh, jump into the questions. I'll read them out. Uh, most of these were submitted on Twitter in advance. So first questions from Just Good Stuff Eleven. Hi Brian, I'd really like to hear your vision on what is needed for a crypto to become mass adopted and what the crypto must be able to do in terms of decentralization. A whole bunch of things here. Which crypto really and truly comply to to this? Thanks. Um, yeah. So I think how does crypto you know become mass adopted or go mainstream? I think there's three things in my mind. First one is. Um, Volatility, second one is scalability, third one is usability. So um, the volatility, you know, it's if crypto is still wildly swinging all over the place, it's going to be harder to use as a real medium of exchange. And, you know, stable coins are helping with that. The other thing that's going to help with that is just uh, more and more real use cases in the world happening so that these uh, these crazy bubbles that go up and down and all the speculation in crypto will kind of get dampened out if we drive the utility phase. So the first one's volatility. Um, Second one is scalability. So luckily there's now, you know, five to 10 really well-funded teams out there working on um, all kinds of solutions from uh, layer two solutions like Lightning Network to, um, to next gen protocols. And so a lot of these are gonna be coming out and continuing to grow in the next six months to 12 months. Um, I think once we do that, you know, we need to get crypto to be not just, you know, five, 10, 20 transactions a second, but on the order of, 500 a second to 5,000 a second to really be at like PayPal or Visa levels. Um, that would allow us to get, say, an app with 100 million people using it in crypto. So scalability is the second one. And the third one is usability. So um, there's still a lot of challenges there. You, know, you, can, you can imagine in a lot of these apps that are out there you know, in DeFi or dApps, it's still too complicated to go there, be able to sign in you know, your, your wallet, whether it's in a Chrome extension or on mobile. Um, it should work like WeChat or something like that, where when you go to the app, it already knows who you are and um, it has your payment method already attached. And with one tap, you can then complete an action or complete a, um, a payment. And so we need to get that usability just simpler and simpler and simpler, kind of like having the, the Netscape moment or the iPhone moment for, uh, for crypto. So let's keep moving on to other questions. This one's from uh, Johnny Mode Trades. Why doesn't Coinbase Pro provide more advanced yet relatively basic trading features such as average position entry and PL. Ah, well, um, that's a great point. PL is on the roadmap. Uh, that's something we've been trying to get on there for a long time. Um, you know, some of these other ones like average position entry, if you all want to see that, would love to hear it. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to get whatever people would think is best. So good idea. Let's move on. So Devil Ninja 777. Um, your thoughts on Bitcoin and why you think some of the community became skeptical of your support or intentions. Yeah, so there's, there's an interesting backstory to this. Um, and of course, you know, we love Bitcoin. I love Bitcoin. Um, we want Bitcoin to succeed in the world. Uh, but if you go back to so the origins of this, it was probably 2013, 2014. Um, there was a debate that sort of started to emerge in the community about um, should the block size increase or what are other ways that we could scale Bitcoin? And, um, you know, for me, I was initially I was very involved in this debate and I was I was thinking, well, if Bitcoin could become this um, scalable payment network, uh, you know, certainly we should try block size, but we should probably do the other things as well. I totally underestimated how controversial this idea might become in the, the Bitcoin community. And so um, for a while, I tried to be involved in it because I felt like it would help it move forward to, to build consensus. I actually flew to China, met with a bunch of the miners there because uh, there was a big divide, I think, just between the different cultures and the different languages. Um, I wrote a blog post about it, my experience there and at some of the conferences. And to be honest, I kind of regret that because I I think I, you know, I said some things in that blog post that just called into question, like, um, you know, are some of the core developers uh, adding value or detracting value just in the way that they're working with other people? And honestly, it wasn't a very nice thing to do. I regret doing it in hindsight. 
Um, but after a little while, you know, I realized that just Bitcoin was not going to unite under kind of a common idea and move forward. And there was enough divisiveness out there that um, I didn't I didn't think that I was adding any value. And so I changed our position on it at that point to basically just being agnostic towards um, all the all the coins and protocols that were out there and doing our best to support all of them on Coinbase because I didn't want to try to be in the business of um, picking winners. And so we just sort of took a step back and said, we're going to be supportive of everyone as best we can. Um, I think that's been the right stance. And since about 2014 or 2015, that's where we've, that's what we've done. So, um, we love Bitcoin. Hopefully anybody who comes to meet me in person, they'll, they'll, uh, you know, be able to be friends with us. <laughs> so moving on, uh, Tristanite E, where do you see Bitcoin in 10 years? I mean, what is the ultimate goal. Ooh, interesting. Um, well, you know, I think of it very much in terms of like the mission of Coinbase, which is to create this open financial system for the world. Um, the way I see Bitcoin is um, it's going to power, you know, this global um, decentralized open financial system that's going to create a lot of innovation in the world. Um, it's going to create a lot of economic freedom. It'll create a lot of economic um, equality too. So what I want is you know, basically for the internet to have this native currency and for people all over the world to build uh, cool apps and have anybody who has an idea, it could spread all over the world faster and, you know, receive payments or pay, pay out to different people all over the world and just sort of have a level playing field for that and remove a lot of the bureaucracy and inefficiency and corruption um, that's out there in the world. So that's what I think the ultimate potential is for, for crypto. And like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of barriers to get there. Um, you know, the volatility, the scalability, usability, the early use cases have all been about um, investment or speculation. And I think that's fine as a way to get started. And it, that's what's got the first 30, 40, 50 million people in the world who to now have a little bit of cryptocurrency. But really, the next step is that we need to um, start to connect those people into an economic graph, um, just like a social graph, you know, where there's people with friends on the edges, but instead of it being about friendship or something like that, this is about money movement or value transfer. And so um, we, we need to take all these individual people, connect them into this economic graph and really grow the utility of crypto um, to be to be that really that benefit that it's providing in the world. And that's that's what the ultimate potential of cryptocurrency is. Let's go to the next question uh, from Twitter. Also, these are all from Twitter. Um, Rad Vladdy asks, Shouldn't supporting open source devs be somewhat proportionate to the profit that Coinbase makes off of various coins and projects? Um, yeah, I think that's honestly an area that we probably have not done very well in the past. Um, just a quick history of that. So um, I would say it might have been 2014 or so we open sourced um, a Bitcoin node that we wrote. We did it under the Toshi name and it was something that we had created internally to kind of um, operate at, at our scale, um, you know, ultimately that node, you know, it, it was quickly became obsolete. We actually ended up rewriting our, our infrastructure again um, internally and the people who were maintaining it internally left. And so we didn't really end up maintaining that. Um, later, we actually created a protocol team internally at Coinbase that whose only job was to kind of work on open source projects. We were never able to manage to like really staff it the way that I wanted. Um, and again, you know, uh, one or two of those people ended up phasing out to other things eventually. Um, we also briefly ended up donating some pretty small amounts to a couple open source projects. So there's no doubt that we've really benefited from open source as a company. And, you know, even back when I was writing more code, I actually contributed to a bunch of open source projects. Um, you can see some of them on my GitHub page still. But, um, you know, to this at this moment in this time, we have not really done a great job like giving back to the to the open source community. Um, I feel like the place where we've been able to add more value is just onboarding all these people into crypto and sort of the, the sort of things that we usually end up dealing with that a lot of people don't want to deal with are um, it's the compliance, it's the regulatory, it's the security um, work to go do this in a whole bunch of countries, um, you know, do do the 14th pen test, like fix the, the, the vulnerabilities, make sure all of our disaster recovery and patches are up to date so that um, in all these countries around the world, we can just keep more onboarding more and more people into Bitcoin. Um, that's where we've been able to add the most value today. And so I'd like to add value in open source too. Um, I think I need to think more about that, honestly. 
All right. So t the next Twitter question here from the Salvation Army in Greece. Oh, wow. What is your criteria for determining which charity and needs are supported by the awesome work of Give Crypto? How do other nonprofits like ours working with refugees in Greece submit proposals for consideration? Oh, cool. So, yeah, for those of you who don't know, um, Give Crypto is a charity that um, I helped set up with Joe Waltman uh, last year, which is uh, the goal of it is just to send um, cryptocurrency to places in the world that are going through economic crisis. Um, we did a whole bunch of experiments starting in Q4. And uh, right now we're focusing on Venezuela just because that's a, a place that's going through economic crisis kind of most visibly in the world. But um, as you pointed out here, there's certainly refugees all over the world. And, um, you know, I, I think we should scale to support all of them, ideally. Um, so far, you know, OK, I'll tell you what, if you want to if you want a place to go submit um, proposals for consideration, um, Joe at givecrypto.org. Sorry, Joe, I'm going to leak your email out there to the world. Um, but send your proposals in to Joe and he is happy to, to set those up. So um, and if, by the way, if any of you haven't already, please go visit the site givecrypto.org and um, we'd, we'd love any um, donations that you're willing to make. All right. This is this question's from uh, YouTube, Max Bronstein. Uh, hey, Brian, what do you see as the next breakout use case for cryptocurrency lending, derivatives, prediction markets, staking, something else? Um, interesting. So. Yeah, I think, you know, on Coinbase, we just recently announced uh, we we some staking support uh, for Tezos and Coinbase custody. And um, that was a really good, you know, um, action or verb that we're, we're adding into the Coinbase platform. Um, in the economic graph that I talked about earlier, uh, we, we really call that like the crypto economy internally. How are we building the crypto economy? And in the economic graph, you know, you have these nodes and you have the, the connections between them, which are kind of like nouns and verbs. And so we keep thinking, you know, like, what are the other verbs that are going to take off next? So it used to just be buy and sell, send and receive. Um, now we've seen stake get added to the platform. Um, earn is another good verb. If you guys have seen our earn pages, um, coinbase.com slash earn, where we're allowing people to start to earn money with crypto by learning about it, you know, hopefully in the future by completing small jobs or tasks. Um, other other verbs that we're looking at, you know, are around, um, as you pointed out here, borrow, lend. Um, there's a bunch of them in, in um, prediction markets. There's governance verbs like voting. Um, DeFi is playing with a bunch of these as well. So um, and, and I think driving just some of the commerce verbs like spend as well. Um, so less of like the investment side and more of the utility side. I think some of those are some of the ones that we can hopefully grow in the future. And um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. All right. So from Twitter, uh, Stephen Ullman or Stefan Ullman asks, uh, forward looking product discussion, even if speculative, is what is the stuff that makes your team and investors nervous? <laughs> um, hmm. They're generally just excited about what we're doing. I'm trying to think. I mean, uh, operating kind of the regulated side of the crypto world, there's always, we're always like have a foot in both worlds where on the one hand, you know, we're, we're speaking with banks and regulators somewhere in the world to try to educate them and get them comfortable with crypto. And I can't tell you how many conversations like that we've had. And then on the other hand, um, you know, we're trying to ensure that the crypto com community is happy and that the latest thing that people want to do, whether it's like, you know, Uniswap or whatever, um, that that we're able to kind of support that. So when we have like the kind of the bleeding edge over here and then we're sort of bringing along the mainstream on the other side. So the stuff that makes sometimes... Um, you know, our board, our investors nervous is like, um, you know, what's our relationship like with this bank partner or this regulator or um, are we or simultaneously, what, what's our relationship like with the crypto community? I feel like we're often torn between these two groups, like, you know, trying to uh, strike the right balance. So I don't know. I don't feel like that was a very good answer, but that, that was the first thing that came to my head. So. All right. So we've got another question here from. Um, from YouTube, I think. Adrian Shafour, what is Coinbase doing in regards to um, decentralization products? Hmm. I'm not sure if you're talking about decentralization generally or um, some specific products there. You know, um, I'll, I'll assume it's the former. Maybe if, if you can clarify somehow in Twitter or, or YouTube, let me know. But I mean, one thing we're doing, like with Coinbase Wallet, for, for instance, um, you know, that's a product that you can be in full control of your, your own keys. Um, it's it's much more decentralized in that sense. Um, 
And, you know, I think that's a really good option for people who want to um, start to use dApps and um, cont- be in full control of their own keys. So I think like that's one thing that we're doing. Um, you know, decentralization is really a spectrum. If I'll just go on a, go on a side for a, a minute here, like, um, you know, in, in, in Coinbase, our, our main app, for instance, you know, we're controlling people's keys. Um, there's a trade off there that it makes it a little bit easier uh, for people if, you know, if they forget their password or something like that, like we're just managing all of the security for them. And as I pointed out, Coinbase wallet, you know, you can kind of do it yourself if people are comfortable with that. But um, one of the things that's still really important to us is just even in the main Coinbase app is that it always remains interoperable with the, the other, the rest of the ecosystem and all of cryptocurrency. So, uh, you know, you should always be able to withdraw your crypto from there. Um, even if, if you buy it on our platform, you don't want to start with us. That's fine. You can take it off. Um, and store it wherever you like, or move it to a different wallet and use it, use something different. So I think the interoperability um, just gives consumer choice. And that's like a great step in the right direction towards decentralization. All right, let's see if uh, there's any more questions here. So we've got one from YouTube. Uh, Vosk Coin Brian, if that was the name that you added. Uh, what are your thoughts on the future of cryptocurrency mining and proof of work? Mm. Well, let's see. I mean, proof of work is like still the most trusted thing that came out and it's sort of stood the test of time. So, I mean, that was like a brilliant invention in the original um, Satoshi white paper that kicked off this whole revolution. So I don't think that'll go away anytime soon, especially, you know, in Bitcoin. Um, But a lot of these next gen protocols are experimenting with with proof of uh, stake. And, you know, there are some benefits there if it's the energy usage or the scalability. Um, so my hope is that as an industry, we can just keep innovating and, um, you know, the Bitcoin paper was this huge seminal moment in computer science and economics. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that there's people kind of standing on the shoulders of giants and continuing to move it forward. So we'll see how many, uh, protocols in five years are are using proof of stake. Um, Twitter question from, I wear a hoodie. I have a genuine non-troll question. Thank you for that. Uh, given money is such an emotive issue or emotional issue and with so much noise in 2019 how do you as a business leader filter out the noise while still responding to your users feedback oh man that's a good one um yeah so as i posted on twitter you know i am a little bit of an introvert and um i don't always uh enjoy going out there to like be a super super public figure just because um you know it can be a little overwhelming at times and just um i like to you know work with the teams inside here at coinbase to, to help build great things and um, so this is a good way, way for me. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, stepping out there a little bit to just interact more with the community in a way that kind of works with my style. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, you're right. Money is a really an emotional issue for people. And there's this funny thing that happens where if you look at like my Twitter feed or comments on Reddit or whatever, or even our customer support inbox, um, you know, sometimes people are upset about something. But in person, um, I don't think I've ever met a single person that was upset with me or rude in in real life um, from the crypto community. So everybody, I think this is just a general problem of the internet. It's like um, people are mean online and they're really nice in person. Um, So I try to just to not really read uh, most of the comments, to be honest. Like when I posted out this Twitter um, question here to see what people wanted to read about, um, you know, there was a bunch of kind of stuff that came in from the Digibyte community and everyone's sort of trying to get get on our radar with like whatever the thing is they that they're most passionate about. Um, but luckily, there's a team that I have that kind of went through all of that and pulled out like the relevant questions. And those are the ones we're trying to answer today. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's that was maybe this. I just scratched the surface on that question. Like, <laughs> how do you maintain your sanity in a world where like the Internet exists is like a much deeper topic. <laughs> Um, all right. So next Twitter question is from Graham C. Bain. Are you and Jack friends? Oh, I assume you mean Jack Dorsey. Um, I don't know if we're friends. I've met him like a couple times, once or twice. Um, and I'm excited to see that they're now getting into crypto and Jack's getting really interested in it. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we're like close friends, but I, I would love to be closer friends. Uh, the more people in crypto, the better. So um, Twitter question from Scallywag. That's a good name. Just the basics, really. Who are you? What are you about? What motivates you to stay in crypto? Ooh, good one. Um, Let's see. Who am I? So, I mean, I'm basically just a nerd who likes to build stuff with technology. Um, (laughs) I, you know, I, I, as a kid, I was like really shy, introverted. Um, I read a lot of books. I was not cool. I was not popular. Um, 
and I, I sort of found computers. You know, I grew up in Silicon Valley. My mom worked at IBM. Uh, we had like an early 486 PC. I started uh, tinkering around with that, trying to learn how to code. You know, I was like, I was like the nerdy kid in high school, whatever, like trying to read a book on programming or whatever while everybody was playing sports. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I think now, you know, I went through college. I, I studied computer science and economics. I, I tried doing another startup in college. It was this education company. It wasn't super successful, but I learned a lot. And um, after college, I tried a few different jobs. Um, didn't really like working at big companies, but I, I did join a couple startups that really helped me understand how to do a startup better. Um, companies like Airbnb. And so eventually I just decided in uh, around 2011 or, or so, I decided to actually take another go at starting another company and uh, had, had read the Bitcoin white paper in December 2010. And this was like the thing I felt I was best capable of doing in the world. And I was really passionate about it just because I, I was really excited about, you know, how do I create more freedom in the world? And um, I felt like I had kind of missed this, um, this big tech revolution. As I was growing up, you know, the internet was really being born and I was in, I was in high school and then in college. And I remember graduating from college and I was thinking about it like maybe I missed out on like the biggest techno technological revolution of our time because a lot of the big tech companies already started, been formed, you know, like, like Google and Amazon. Um, and I, from a historical point of view, I was like, you know, the telegraph, radio, television, like it's not that often that these big kind of game chain uh, global networks come along. Um, and so when I read the white paper for Bitcoin, I was like, oh my gosh, this could be another big network like that. But it's global, decentralized. It's just like the internet. But instead of moving information around, you can move value around. And I bet we could make all kinds of things more efficient. You know, as an entrepreneur, I had really felt the pain of this, the, the bureaucracy of like trying to move money around to all these different people and pay them and the high fees and um, all the paperwork and stuff. And so I was like, I felt really passionate about um, something could be better. Like if the, if the internet had this native uh, global currency, that it would just create more freedom in the world. So um, that's kind of what, what got it all started. I, you know, what I'm trying to think what else um, I'm all about. Like at this point, I'm, I'm just enjoying the, the process of learning. I'm also just a lifelong learner. So Coinbase has been this crazy wild ride. You know, we have 750 employees now. Every every month I have to learn some new skill and just, you know, whether it's like management or fundraising or how to communicate in a larger organization or um, learning about smart contracts or whatever. So in that sense, it's been really rewarding. And I'd say just like moving up the, um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I've been trying to think about like, what do I want to do in 10 years, like 20 years? Um, you know, I'm, I've been starting to think a little bit more about um, giving back and philanthropy, like the give crypto thing I mentioned or the giving pledge. So, um, you know, I want to keep building things. I think I'll be doing that the rest of my life is just, I want to build cool things with technology that help the world and um, hopefully have some fun along the way. So that's what I'm all about. All right. Uh, another Twitter question from co-op crypto. How did you find Bitcoin and what did you think of Bitcoin from an engineer perspective? Yeah, so um, December 2010, I was home at my parents' house and um, for the holidays, and I just happened to read the Bitcoin white paper on Hacker News. I remember thinking it was super, it, it captured my attention right away, and I just couldn't stop reading it. And I actually, I had to read it like probably three or four times in the next few months to try to really fully understand it. Um, something about it really immediately grabbed me. I think I had enough of a computer science background in economics when I read it to, to, to sort of something sparked. I was like, this, this might be the most important thing I've read in a long, long time. Um, and it wasn't until I actually, you know, implemented the first um, Bitcoin node that was powering Coinbase, um, which was a whole story by itself, by the way, because I, you know, my C++ wasn't very good. So I couldn't, I didn't want to try to use the, um, the open source node, which probably would have been a better thing in hindsight, honestly. So I actually re-implemented our own Bitcoin node in Ruby and I wrote the whole test suite for it and it started syncing with the blockchain. Um, and I did it all based on the white paper and some of the documentation on the Bitcoin wiki. And that was when I, I think after, it took me about three months and after about three months, I, I think I really fully understood the protocol at a deeper level. Um, so I was, it's simul it was kind of right, one of those sweet spots where it was definitely a stretch for me technically um, to try to understand it and to, to code it. Um, it was getting, you know, it was a binary protocol, like all these things I hadn't really done before. But um, from the engineering perspective, I, it was elegant. It was beautiful. Um, and it was, 
it was something that it made me just really wonder about who was the person who had this idea locked up in their head. And, you know, that's a whole discussion for another day. So, um, all right. Twitter question from Raymond Dirk. Uh, the number one question on people's mind in the space is the balance between making money and what's right for the community. We believe in the mission, appreciate the payment rails, but why add assets that tarnish the brand? Don't add everything. Add solid projects with great engineers. Uh, female too. Okay. Female engineers. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. You know, um, so Coinbase started, and we and we were just Bitcoin, and um, you know, there was really part of me that was hoping, uh, from a simplicity of the product point of view, I was like, I really just hope everything's going to be Bitcoin because then we can just um, you don't have to give people this like idea of choosing different ones or you know switching between them. Um, and it became clear at a certain point, you know, we always just we go talk to our customers and we see what they want, um, and it became clear at a certain point that more and more of them wanted to use Ethereum. And so we kind of resisted for a while, but we were like, all right, let's put put a second one in there. And then there was a third and then there was a fourth. And now it's getting into this place where I don't know how many, like if, if we fast forward five years, I'm not really sure how many um, protocols are gonna be uh, globally used. Like that might end up being kind of like fiat currencies where there's like five or six majors and a whole bunch of minor ones. But I do think there'll be millions of tokens, which you know there could be a token for every, um, company or, you know, side project or GitHub repo or uh, nonprofit. So um, there are, I think that ship has sailed at this point, like we're going to be in a world with many, many tokens. And so the question to your, maybe to your question more um, directly is how do we add the ones that, that don't tarnish um, the brand or like the whole industry maybe, because there are a lot of projects out there that are just probably outright scams and um, you know, that's not good for anybody. So here, here's the way I think about this now. Um, I think about it a lot like um, Google or Amazon. So um, I'll tell you the general principle and then I'll give you a specific example. So the, the general idea is um, everything that's not a scam or, or harmful to people should be should be added. Um, but we should give people ratings and ways for them to evaluate these different um, tokens and coins. So a good example is Amazon, right? Uh, there, there might be a product on there that has two out of five stars and you can choose whether or not to buy it. Um, but if it's not like a fraudulent product or something, they're not actually going to remove it. Right. Similarly, um, Google, right. They have, they're going to index the whole web. Like if they didn't index the whole web and show results for the whole web, it would be an incomplete search engine. But if there is some, a site that has malware or, you know, the HTTPS certificate has expired or whatever, they might show you a warning and they're not going to let you do something that actually hurts you but they're not gonna try to um, tell you what you should or should not uh, look at or use on the internet unless they think it's really dangerous. Um, they just think it's low quality. They might rank it lower or give it a lower rating. So that's, I think, the world we're moving to um, with Coinbase. And hopefully that is the best of both worlds. All right, so we've got a YouTube question here from uh, Wumi K. Hi, Brian, do you have issues balancing work and personal life or is it all work, work, work? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, it's actually something I think about a lot. I do, I like to work hard. Um, I think one of the biggest risks in uh, companies and startups generally though, is that people burn out and um, that's not good. I mean, you need to be able to be, if you want to accomplish anything of real you know, impact in the world, I think it takes at least a decade, um, sometimes longer. And so um, I practice this art myself. I, I'd say every, Every few years running Coinbase, you know, it's definitely really stressful running a company. And I've had to sort of um, do an audit of how's my energy? What are the things that are fun? What are the things that are not fun? And try to really just like stop doing or delegate the things um, which are not fun. Um, having an exec coach really helps with that. Um, someone who can be sort of like an accountability partner to come in there and audit your calendar and help you, force you to make the hard decisions. Um, you know, things like getting enough sleep, getting exercise. There's there's usually one day a week, like Saturday, I just completely disconnect from work, try not to look at anything work related. Um, yeah, I would say uh, e even just like nutrition, meditation, all that stuff. You know, there's been some moments in Coinbase's history where it was it was just like, oh man, this is this is overwhelming. Like I'm burned out, and um, I need to go take like at least a weekend off, or sometimes a week, and. Um, just recharge and hopefully come back with like a fresh perspective. I, th I think that's honestly one of the most important things um, to be able to do anything for a long time. So good topic. Thanks for asking it. 
All right, so uh, Twitter question from Nian Moon, if, her, if I'm saying your name correctly, or Nian. Um, can we expect bank transfers to go through any faster than seven business days that it typically, typically takes? Um, good question. So yes, I do think it's possible to drive that down over time. Um, for anybody who's not aware, uh, if you buy a, uh, some crypto on Coinbase using a, a bank transfer, um, oftentimes the coins will take you know up, up seven days or so. It depends. The weekend, there's a business day thing in there. And the underlying cause there is that um, the ACH system in the US you know, it usually takes um, two to three business days to transfer funds, which you know if you're over a long weekend, can turn into six. We actually pad that a little bit and we do we, we wait even a little bit longer. And the reason is that um, it's all about just managing fraud rates. And, um, you know, anybody who's tried to launch an app or a site that lets you buy and sell crypto or uh, other types of fintech products online, they know that there's a crazy amount of fraudsters out there who are trying to put in, you know, stolen bank accounts, stolen credit cards, stolen IDs. Um, and so the sooner you can kind of wait to get a little bit of a chargeback um, signal there into your you know, fraud management system, um, you can reduce that rate. And it can be it can be a really um, dangerous thing for actually a lot of startups who, who launch this and they're not aware of it. And, you know, you can go go home from work for the weekend, come back on Monday and like, you know, $250,000 of fraud happened and that's your whole seed round and like you have to shut down. So um, anyway, long story short, it's a way that we manage the fraud rate. I do think over time we'll be able to get it down just by getting better and better at all of the different fraud signals that we collect and the, and the machine learning behind that, which is a really cool uh, computer science problem. Um, YouTube question from Maxabillion. How do you plan to reach users who have very little understanding of blockchain and crypto? Um, yeah, I mean, I think about this, it's kind of like electricity, right? You should be able to use it even if you don't understand how the electrons and circuits work. Um, so I think, you know, we've got to make this simpler and simpler. I think that's one of the things Coinbase has been good at overall, but we, even we should, could go way farther with this. Um, you know, an example, I'll give you some simple examples. So like, um, we've tried to move in this direction of like, the default thing that you show people is, is a fiat amount, right? And instead of sending to an, um, a Bitcoin address, send it to like something that looks like a username, right? Or like an email address, um, something that's human readable, not machine readable. I think um, there's a lot of efforts out there that are on the horizon around this. There's a whole bunch of people working on decentralized identity, which I think is really cool. Uh, so again, be able to send it to like a username. Um, you know, there's the Ethereum naming, name system, um, which is cool. Um, and I think apps like Coinbase Wallet are, are making an attempt to get this even simpler. But um, honestly, there's a long way to go on that. So uh, you're asking the right question. All right, Twitter question from Heavy Heavy Coin. Uh, go on Joe Rogan. <laughs> um, that would be fun. I mean, he has a really good distribution. Lots of people watch it. Apparently, um, I'm actually I'm thinking about doing more podcasts. So if there's any that are out there that are um, awesome that you'd love to see, uh, you see me go on. I'm I'm down to check it out. Maybe, maybe if you, if you all want me to go on Joe Rogan, maybe hit him up or whatever. I'm, <laughs> if you guys send, send the Digibyte community after him, I'm, I'm, I'm down to go on Joe Rogan. All right. Um, Twitter question from Alex Badalin, Badalian. Uh, what's one app that nobody has built for crypto, but really should. Hmm. Let's see. I mean, a couple of people have tried variants of this. I think there should, there's gotta be some site like the Reddit equivalent um, with crypto where, you know, every upvote, like there's all these sites that use karma points, like Stack Overflow, Reddit, you know, Hacker News, like there's got to be one that blows up that is you're earning real money with every karma point. I, I don't understand why that hasn't happened yet. Um, let's see. I think, I mean, there's there's people working on all of these. They just haven't hit it big yet. Like um, paying a little, pay a little bit of crypto to access um, Wi-Fi. Um, you know, I think prediction markets are super cool. Like the interfaces for those are getting better and better. Um, there's a whole bunch. We actually have a hackathon coming up at Coinbase. I should probably pull up that list. Or I'll, maybe maybe we can post out like some of the top ideas from that and have the community <laughs> go build it. We can Coinbase Ventures can make a small investment if um, we see one that's good. All right, from Mike Dudas, uh, do you expect a retail resurgence in 2019 or do you think we'll have to wait for 2020? Oh man, I mean, I I always feel like the game of trying to predict uh, what you know what's going to happen with the trading volume and price and everything is. I try just not to play that game. Um, I mean, I hope 
whether it happens in 2019 or 2020, I think either one is okay. I just generally, I want the industry to actually to focus less and less on, um, you didn't even say trading in your question, but I'm assuming maybe incorrectly assuming that that's what you're referring to. I don't want people to focus so much on trading and the price. I, I want us to focus on um, building more use cases for crypto, more applications, um, getting it in more countries, making it easier for everybody in the world to buy a little bit of it. All right, so we'll do maybe a couple more here. Let's see, Twitter question from Real Real Lear 2. Is Coinbase currently trying to get more fiat on ramps? For example, top up services like Azteco or using tellers like Abra. Yes, we are um, expanding to more countries and always adding more uh, fiat payment integrations. Uh, Twitter question from Crypto Chris G. Brian, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Sometimes yes. It can make it can make it, but margarita pizza, no. All right, a few minutes left. Twitter question from Sweden Fork. Why the decision to only allow XRP and USDT uh, for Coinbase international transfers and not BTC? Uh, the rationale of faster processing is BS given BTC has many more fiat off ramps. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, you can definitely send BTC off platform as well uh, and use it for uh, remittance. Um, I think you're referring to there was a landing page that we put out that was sort of um, emphasizing some of the use cases around it. Um, don't read too much into that. Like you can you can you do remittance with crypto on Coinbase and XRP, BTC, you know, USD coin, all of the above. So um, and I agree with you. Bitcoin has way more fiat off ramps. Telegram question. Um, What's the most ambitious thing Coinbase wants to do in the next five years? Any weird moonshot stuff? Ooh, actually, I love moonshots. Um, <laughs> I always get the most excited about companies that are trying like crazy ambitious things, which is part of what I hope we're doing at Coinbase. You know, like creating an open financial system for the world is kind of like reinventing the entire economy of the world. So I hope that <laughs> I think we qualify for that, hopefully. Um, let's see. Most ambitious things. I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the ambitious things is like with Give Crypto, um, we want to give 100,000 people in Venezuela a little bit of crypto like in the next, uh, you know, roughly 12 months. And so um, I want to see if we can spark a bunch of usage there and actually have a country in the world tip. In, in other words, like 50 percent or more of all transactions in the economy are happening in crypto. Like that would be amazing. Maybe, you know, honestly, like overthrow some corrupt dictators in the world. That would be awesome. Um, weird moonshot stuff. I mean. I mean, one, I'm big on like writing down goals and everything like that. One, one goal that I write down um, every morning is like, I want to have a billion people accessing an open financial system in the world um, every day, like hopefully, you know, through our products. But if it can be, um, if it can be the whole community making it happen, like even better. Um, I think if we get to a billion, there's a reasonable path that like it would get eventually to 50% of the world economy. Um, so that's, that's one kind of moonshot thing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a bunch. Um, I, I could probably think of more, but I'll, we'll keep moving along. YouTube question from Tom Ty: um, What is Coinbase company culture like? Hmm. So, I mean, actually, I'd say the cult, the culture is like evolving, um, just because we added so many people back in 2018 um, that you know uh, we opened a bunch of offices. Coinbase has offices now in uh, New York, London, Portland. Um, Manila, you know, um, others. And so we're, we have 750 people, a lot of new talent came into the org and it's, it's never, it's never been better, um, honestly, but the, the org, the culture has continued to evolve. So I'll share a few high level thoughts about the culture and then um, share a little bit about where it's going. So one of the things we're big on is um, clear communication. Um, you know, everybody, we, we look to hire people that are succinct, candid, kind, just great at conveying information, good listeners. Um, one of the other values we have is around positive energy. So uh, we look for people who are really just optimistic, um, especially when things get get difficult. Um, you know, they try to bring the other others around them up and like uh, just very, you know, um, collaborative in that effect. Um, third value is around continuous learning. So we're always trying to um, salvage the lesson from any setback and like get really curious. Um, uh, we do a lot of coaching, like we bring in a lot of speakers. Uh, put people in stretch roles, um, all with the goal of trying to level them up in their career and just do continuous learning. And then the last part of the culture is we talk about a lot is efficient execution. Um, so we re really look for people who can get a lot done with a little. 
um, who can do 80-20 analysis, you know, good prioritization, automation. Um, so those are kind of the four tenets of the culture today. We're actually, we're, we just finished writing up this culture doc internally um, where we tried to get really one layer down and, and talk about um, how we operate day to day. So hopefully I'll be sharing that later this quarter um, for people who are interested. I think, I think it's better. One thing I realize is that as companies grow, I mean, if you're at 25 or 50 people, you know everybody's name, you're all kind of in one building or room, and um, it's easy to know what everyone's working on, and a culture can really be sort of um, passed through verbal uh, communication at that point. And as a company gets bigger, you start to be in multiple locations, um, you know, you cross the Dunbar number, 150 people, culture really can start to drift if you don't um, get really clear and write it down and then repeat it at every step. So it needs to be repeated to candidates who are thinking about if they're going to join. It needs to be repeated in onboarding. It needs to be repeated at the all hands every quarter. Um, you know, you need to weave it into how you do performance reviews and, and uh, uh, promotions and compensation and everything like that. So that's what we're in the process of doing now. We're, we're kind of, I feel like Coinbase is kind of like this awkward teenager of a company. Um, like we, we're a startup, but we're like getting a little bigger and we're learning how to like fit in our new body. Um, so that's been a fun process in the last um, couple quarters, especially. And I think we're just, we're going to keep getting better and better at it this year. All right. From Telegram, um, how does Coinbase see their Silicon Valley orientation, crypto nativity, for lack of a better word, as a meaningful edge in an industry with new financially oriented entrants? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's always this question like, is, is Coinbase a finance company or is it a tech company? And, you know, we are in Silicon Valley. And so traditionally people think of like the tech being on the West Coast and the financial services being on the East Coast. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, we have people at Coinbase who are from finance and we have people who are from tech. If I had to pick one, I would pick tech. I think we're more of a tech company than finance. And the, the reason is that, you know, tech is changing the world. It's innovating. It's not to say that finance isn't, but a little bit less of that. So I think we need that skill set. And, you know, an example of a com like a company it's too tech focused. Like you end up trying to reinvent something that is already well understood in finance and you just, you're doing it for no reason. So you need both skill sets, but I want to bring more of a tech mindset to, um, to Coinbase. And, and really it is something new. It's, it's a crypto company, which is a, it's a hybrid of the both a hybrid of both. So, um, yeah, I mean, we have a New York office. Um, we have a lot of really great people there, both engineering and people doing um, sales, working with all the institutions that are out there, um, many of them are Coinbase cu custody customers now. Uh, so we're going to be both, but I think, you know, a lot of our product is still um, rooted in San Francisco. All right. YouTube question from Ted Brady. Uh, what is your answer when people ask you, what do you use Bitcoin for? Hmm. I mean, well, I, uh, I don't know. I, I do pay people with Bitcoin. Um, I actually, one thing I've been doing for about seven years at this point is anytime I'm at dinner or you know an event or birthday party or something and people are interested in crypto, I usually just give them like five or $10 of crypto. I've been doing that for about seven years. Um, and back when I first started that, like $5 of crypto was one Bitcoin. So um, there's literally like hundreds of people back in 2013, you know, 2012 timeframe um, that I gave a whole Bitcoin to um, just for fun for like five dollars at a party or something and many of those people have come back to me and kind of thanked me and um, been surprised or whatever so um i still do that today i, I pay for things with, with bitcoin um i think you know if the here here's one thing i've been thinking about internally and sharing with the team so if you think about the most common uh transaction that happens in the economy think about like the most mainstream thing like paying for a cup of coffee at Starbucks with a credit card. If, if there's sort of like a normal distribution of payments in the world. And like that's square square in the middle. And I think that's actually going to be like the last area that gets disrupted by, by digital currency. Digital currency is actually going to be used more on the, on the fringes first and slowly move mainstream. So the fringes are, you know, over here on the right, there's power users of money. Like people who need to send a million dollars um, to some invest in something in 10 minutes, right? Somewhere else around the world or a developer who's trying to script and automate, you know, distributions of payment to thousands of people for $1 around the world. And then on the other side, you have um, people who are um, unbanked or deplatformed, you know, emerging markets, Venezuela. This is kind of where Give Crypto is playing. And so crypto is sort of playing most uh, strongly today at the edges, these power users, and then the deplatformed or unbanked. And I think it's slowly going to work its way into the middle. Um, that's what we're trying to do at Coinbase. We're trying to build the crypto economy 
not just onboarding in like buy a little bit of crypto and just hold on to it and do nothing, but increasingly connecting these people so they can start to do more things, you know, earn tasks. Um, can they do voting? Can they do staking? Can, can they do borrow lend? Maybe they can get a, a loan to go, um, do, go do something else in their life. Right. Or like start to buy products with crypto. And we want to actually, you know, Coinbase commerce, we want to start to try to integrate that into, into our consumer app to like surface. What are the things that people can buy? Let's, let's put it there right in front of them in the app and let them know about um, places they can spend crypto. So that's how we want to uh, build the crypto economy at Coinbase. And um, that's, that's some of the stuff we're going to be doing this year. All right. Last question. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up uh, from Telegram. What about your vision for the product slash market? Have you been the most wrong about? Oh, man. Um, a lot of things. So one is that um, I'd say I was I, I think I'm like too optimistic sometimes. So back in 2012, um, I thought that there'd be way more usage of crypto uh, for the, I thought the utility phase would be much farther along by now. And it still seems to be fairly focused on trading and speculation. Um, so I was pretty wrong about that. Oh, you want to, if you want to see a good one, I was wrong about, I put out a, um, a blog post and a slide deck, I think in 2014, talking about forks in, in uh, Bitcoin and how um, I was pretty convinced that like um, if there was a fork, the the network would quickly reach consensus um, and it, the the miners would all kind of all shift to one or the other and it was like this seesaw where like it didn't it was very in an unstable state and one would tip or the other was completely wrong about that uh, forks have obviously continued continued to persist and develop their own community um, so I was yeah couldn't have been more wrong um, Okay, so uh, this was this was super fun. Thanks for listening, and um, we'll probably do it again if there's more questions. Um, I see a bunch streaming in here on the right. Sorry, I'm I'm not able to like uh, handle all the stream live, um, <laughs> but uh, we'll probably do more of these. So if you if you all liked it, please uh, just drop us a note and uh, reach out on Twitter with any other ideas um, that can make this better. Just yeah, two things like subscribe to the YouTube channel for Coinbase. Uh, we'll be posting more stuff there, and then um, you know subscribe to Coinbase and, and myself on Twitter and. Um, just send us any questions there. We'll, and if there's good ones, we'll do another one. So thanks all.